Hey now, brawlers, it's time for another Board Game Brawl review with Nick Meenahan, sponsored by BoardGameBliss.com. I really like card games of any kind, and I think I probably have enough light filler card games at this point, but still, I'm always on the lookout for more. That's why I was excited to try Seven Kingdoms from Danko. This is a set collection game. You're trying to get a number of these kingdom cards with different citizens of the kingdoms pictured on there, with crests as well of different colors. You want to have... Um, try to have as many cards as possible to get points, but you also want to try and have certain colors because if you do and there's tokens on the applicable color cards, and if none of this makes sense, then you may actually be able to get a bunch of bonus points as well. And of course, there's special powers on all the cards just to make things more interesting. Let's go ahead and take a look at how Seven Kingdoms is played. Then we're going to come back and I'll let you know what I think. All right, I'm gonna give you a brief run through of Seven Kingdoms. This is a competitive game for two to four players. The goal is to have the most points by the end of the game, and the end of the game is gonna come when one of two things happens. When this deck of cards runs out, as far as I interpret the terrible rules, the game immediately ends, even if you have enough cards there, which uh, the cards there being the cards that you use to fill out the lineup, and each of your hands, uh, you draw three at the beginning of the game. Even if there are enough cards in that main deck to fill out the lineup when the start of a new round, you still end the game immediately also. If each of these crest cards has one of these seven tokens on it, if all, in other words, if all seven tokens are out, there can only be one token per card, the game ends at the end of that current round. Now, this is a set collection game. The theme, I'll admit, is kind of irrelevant, but uh, this entire deck of cards is made up of exactly 49 cards. I'm not counting these crest cards that are out here, the seven of different colors. Um, in, those, in that deck of 49 cards, there are seven different citizens, merchant, princess, king, peasant, and so on. And there are seven cards for each of those classes. So seven times seven, 49 cards. Each of those seven cards is keyed into a different one of these seven crests. So in other words, you can say that there's uh, suits and numbers, I guess is the best way to think of it. And there actually is a number for, each of the cards has their number from one to 49 on the top of them. And that's gonna be important for how fast those cards resolve. But what you're trying to do the, during the course of the game is take as many of those cards as possible because they're all going to be worth a point at the end. But also you may want to try and have control that is dominance over certain colors of cards. Have the most green crests, have the most red crests, hoping that these tokens, which are going to be bonus points, are actually on those cards, in which case you will have control of that token and you'll get the bonus points for them because you have the most of that crest. Now the initial setup of the game is simply having all seven crest cards randomized and making sure that the deck is on one end, the far left end, to signify that this is the start of the row. Then you're gonna randomize, uh, every player gets uh, three cards at random plus seven cards are gonna be put on the opposite, on one of the sides, doesn't really matter which, of the crest cards. And then you're gonna begin the game. Oh, also you randomize these seven tokens and then flip up two of them. Um, I'll actually, I'll show you that right now. So these tokens have uh, numbers one, plus one through plus five for five of the tokens. And then you're gonna have one token that has a crest symbol on it, a generic crest. Uh, one symbol that has a picture of uh, the peasant on it, uh, one of the peasant cards, and then a times two symbol. I'll get back to what those are in a second, but let's just, uh, at the beginning of the game, you just shuffle them up and then make sure that two of them are flipped over uh, no matter what they are. Decide who is going to be first and get the awesome epic first player marker. That actually is better than the first player marker in most games. Then you're gonna begin. Now, starting with the first player, and that will pass at the end of every round, you're gonna take one of the cards in your hand, which like I said, are just like all of the other citizen cards that are in the deck and that are currently out there in the row. You're gonna take one and you're gonna play it face up in front of you. Then the next player in clockwise order is gonna do the same, and then the next. So let's just, I'm just doing this at random. So there's that, and that, and that. So these are the cards that were played. Once everyone has played their card and put it face up, then you look at the numbers at the top of the card from one to 49, and put them in order on the opposite side of the crest from where the row is currently built. So we have a 40, that goes all the way to the left, then the 21, then a seven, then a four. 
and that is going to determine the order in which these cards resolve. So whoever played the 40 goes first and resolves the effects of that card, then the 21, then the 7, then the 4. Now I'm going to break down each card individually and tell you what they do, uh, each of the seven different types of citizens, but essentially each of these cards is going to be taking some cards from the other side of the row. So the merchant takes one card of his choice. I'm just doing this at random. Uh, and then the, I'm not even sure, remember who played which card, but um, then the general gets to take three cards in a row. So he's gonna take these three cards and then the king can take any four cards of his choice. But unfortunately that leaves nothing for the other king that was played. So that person gets nothing, but that's why speed is important in this game. Now, when you take cards, you have two choices. You can either register, quote unquote, the card, which is to say you put it face up in front of you, essentially scoring the card for the end of the game, or you can choose to take a card into hands. Now you have a hand limit of three and you can never just say, okay, I'm gonna take this card and then take this card I already had in my hand and put it out in front of me. You have to have room for the cards that you wanna put into your hand, but you don't have to. If you have one or more spots available in your hand for a card to go into, you can just say, well, I'm gonna score all these and just put them face down in front of me. But if the start of your turn comes around and you have no cards to play, you draw two cards from the deck and then end your turn. You don't get a play for the turn. Now, once every player has resolved their card, has taken cards and registered cards and put them in their hands, then you're gonna start a new round. So this was probably a bad example that I just did for the first round, but let's say that after everything was said and done, there was still these cards left on this side of the row that we were taking from. Those cards would shift down to the, uh, the bottom row. Um, actually, it's, it should be in order. Next to the cards that the players played for the turn, if there's any spots left, you fill it out from the deck. The first player marker passes, and now you do it all over again, but of course you are playing cards on the other side of the row, the cards where the cards originally were. And now we're gonna be trying to take these cards, which could, in, which will include the cards that every player just played on the first turn. This is gonna go back and forth with the players trying to take cards. So now let's go ahead and talk about what all these different citizen cards do. We'll start with the most powerful and work our way down. So we have the, the king. Now the king is the most powerful of the cards. And that, well, first off, every card is normally worth one point at the end of the game. The king has two crests on his card. That means that he's worth two points at the end of the game. And also he has two crests for the purposes of determining control of a particular color. Also, down here, it's kind of hard to see. Let me focus in even more on that. Um, the king has little commas between each of these car, uh, symbols that symbolizes a card. That means that he can take four cards of his choice from the lineup. So when you resolve the effect of the king, he can take any four cards, but remember, he's going last, which means there may not even be four cards to, for him to take, which is exactly what happened in that scenario. And these are cards from one to seven are what his cards are. Next we go to the bishop, and the bishop is the weirdest of the cards, but also possibly the most important. The bishop has essentially three different effects. The first is that when you play the bishop and, uh, and resolve him, you actually get to take the bishop card from the lineup and put him down in front of you. In other words, you don't lose him, you, you play him and you score him immediately. Uh, you just So you play him and put him right back in front of you. Then you get to take one of the face-up tokens and put it out onto one of the crest cards. So let's say that I want the times two token to go onto red. You have to put it on the card that is closest to the deck that is open. In other words, the first token has to go on this red card. And remember this lineup is randomized. Then the next token that someone plays has to go onto the orange. There's always gonna be two face up tokens for you to choose from. So after that, um, then you actually get to take another card from the lineup. So you score the bishop, you place a token, then you get to choose another card if there's one available from the lineup. The, that card, those cards are from eight to 14. And then we go to the general. The general, and remember there is a seven cards of each and one for each type of crest. The general takes three cards, but they have to be in a row which means if there's not three cards in a row or he just doesn't want to take the three cards that are in a row, he may end up with one, two, or potentially zero cards. Next, we have the, uh, the knight. The knight is like a weaker version of the general. She takes two cards in a row. Same rules, she may just take one card or no cards depending on 
how the cards fall for her, I guess. <laughs> Next, we have the Merchant. The Merchant uh, can take any card of... Actually, I skipped a card. I skipped the Princess. That's the one card I was forgetting. Okay, sorry about that. The, the Princess is actually from 21 to 28, and the Knight is from 29 to uh, 35. But the Princess card is like a weaker version of the King. The Princess can take any two cards of her choice from the lineup. So we already did the knight, I skipped ahead. Let's go to the merchant. The merchant is the next card. The merchant can take any one card of his choice. Only one card, but he is a high number, which means he'll be going a lot faster than almost all the other cards. But the card that's gonna be going the fastest usually is the peasant. The peasant is the weakest because he only gets to take one card, but the card that he takes uh, and the card that he takes must be in these particular spots on the board. So he's the only one that actually has slots for the cards indicated on this, uh, uh, specific slots indicated on his card. So they must be the second and third card from the left, counting from the left. Those are one of those two cards are the ones that he must take. But these are the cards that go from uh, 41 to 40, or I'm sorry, 42 to 49. My math is terrible, which means that they're a peasant card is only going to be beaten by another peasant card. <laughs> so that is something to consider. Now, let's go ahead and talk about those tokens and the control of them. How that works, it's very simple, really. So at the end of the game, once you're getting ready to score cards, you'll get a point for every card that you have in front of you and also every uh, card that's in your hand. You still get to score the cards that are in your hand at the end of the game. Um, so the only thing with the hand management there is that you want to make sure that the cards in your hand... Um, you may want to use them during the course of the game, in which case you might lose them, but you're never going to miss the opportunity to score them if you're in your hands. Anyways, uh, what you're going to do is look at all the crests that you have in front of you for all the cards that you've collected. Then ref if you have the most, a clear majority of one of the crests, you look at the card and see if it has a token out on it. Um, if there's a tie for one of control of one of the crests, nobody gets it. But how it works is that for the plus one through plus five tokens, you simply get that many points on top of what you're already getting for that color. That's very simple. The times two token, as you might imagine, doubles the amount of points that you're getting for that color. Then we had the, somewhere in here, the crest card. The crest card, how that works is that if you get dominance for whatever card color, uh, that is associated with the crest token, you look at all the different types of crests that you have in front of you. So if you took a variety of different cards of uh, citizens from different colors, you get an extra point for every diverse color that you have. So if you have cards from five different colors, you get five extra points. Then you have the peasant token. How the peasant token works, it's the only one keyed into a particular citizen. Uh, you will get an extra point for every citizen that you have, uh, or for, I'm sorry, for every peasant that you have if you control the crest that is associated with the peasant token. And that's really it. You're going to play cards, score some of them, uh, keep some of them in your hand to play again, flip uh, the row back and forth, constantly going back until either the deck runs out or all the tokens are out. Then you see who has dominance of all the crests, and then you score points. And whoever has the most is the winner. That's Seven Kingdoms. Theme and components. Theme, no theme. Let's move on. <laughs> it's okay. It's just no theme. Um, as far as the components go, I really like the artwork. The artwork's pretty solid, and the card quality is good. The uh, I will say that the crests on the cards, the number one complaint I've had about the graphic design is that it's tough to tell the orange and the red apart. They do have different actual designs on them aside from the color, but it's still hard, and even I had second guess myself after playing it three times. I still had to like, eh, what's what? Okay, so that's a little weird, but that's kind of just a minor quibble. Everything else looks good. It's just a very small filler game, so I don't expect grandiose components, but what there's, what's there is good. I will say, however, the rule book is horrendous. I don't want to come down too hard on this because it was translated from Korean, I believe, which, you know, honestly, I'm just happy whenever a game from overseas manages to make it over to the U.S., uh, however you get it, and that it has English rules. I'm incredibly grateful for that, and that's why I don't want to come down too hard on it, but it was very poorly translated and when i first pulled out the rule book i'm like okay one half or one side of a sheet of rules this is going to be very simple well i mean because i as a reviewer i usually have to learn games when we sit down at the table to play it and my group is kind of just okay with that they've come to accept that so i'm like all right half sheet of rules no problem we'll have this up and running in five minutes and 15 minutes later we're like oh my brain is starting to 
fry. And finally, I went on to Board Game Geek to see if there was a better translation, and some very kind soul put up a much better uh, run through of the rules in the description on the page. Not complete, but between the two of them, I was able to figure it out because it is a very simple game. It just didn't seem that way when I was reading the poorly translated rules. Some very important things were left out. So that is my word of caution to you if you get the game, go to Board Game Geek right away and it'll make it much, much easier. As far as the gameplay goes, it is so interesting. One of the reasons why I was having trouble reading the rules was because I wasn't prepared for some of the sort of the unique elements to this game. Mostly the whole flipping back and forth aspect. It was tough for me to wrap my head around that at first. It's a very simple thing, but in practice, it's so neat. So you're playing cards on one side of this row in order to take cards on the other, but then that row where you are playing cards becomes the row in the next round that you will be taking cards from. And that's a very cool aspect. Part of it is because the cards that you take, you're either going to take into your hand or you're going to score with. Now, the cards that you take into hand, you'll still, if you have them at the end of the game, you'll still be able to score them, but those are also what you're using to actually take stuff during the course of the game. So playing something to take something is meaning that you're essentially uh, giving up taking that card as a score because you're playing it. Now, someone else might be able to grab it from you in case, but but you might be lucky and you might be able to take it back. So that's part of the strategy of the game. It's like, okay, if I play this card now, if I play this green knight, then I know that I can get some of the cards that I need this turn, but I really would like to keep this green knight. But if next turn I play this peasant card, which is like the fastest card, unless they play a peasant, then I'm going to be able to take, I, I might be able to take back my knight if this works out correctly. That whole aspect of the game of sort of deciding what to sacrifice, essentially. Deciding what you need to play, what you need to keep, that is really cool. I really love that whole aspect of it and the constant flipping back and forth in the row of cards, together with the vying for control of the different crests. Now that's not a new mechanic. We've seen that a lot with uh, any kind of set collection game where you're vying for area control or supremacy of one particular thing in order to get bonus points. But it works really well here, especially with the aspect of the bishop. The bishop is the only way that those tokens are gonna get out there, but you know what? You don't have to play the bishop. You can score the bishop. If you, what do they call it? Registering, I think, in the book. If you just choose to put that bishop down in front of you as a scoring card without playing him, because it, now the bishop can score himself when you play him, but because that's he's like the weirdest card. So he, he, he scores himself if you decide to play him, but you could just collect him on a turn and say, you know what, I'm just going to put him in front of me. I, I'm, I'm collecting him from the lineup and putting him right in front of me. I don't want him in my hands. By doing that, you're limiting the amount of tokens that will be going out on the crest cards, which, depending on how long the game goes, is going to mean that one of the crests, at least, is not going to be worth anything. And I've played this game four times now. I have yet to see it end with all the tokens going out. We've gotten close, but it's usually because the deck runs out. And I'm happy for that, actually, because it means that you're you, there's some forward planning that you have. Like, okay, you can collect a lot of blue cards, but guess what? Blue is the sixth or seventh crest in line. It's very unlikely that you're going to be getting any bonus points off of that. Is it still worth it to you? Uh, so that's a really interesting part here. And the ones that are lowest in the line are going to be getting uh, vied for constantly. And if you know that you don't have dominance in a color that is about to come up, and you know that someone else does, and you're playing the bishop to put a token out, put a crappy token on it. <laughs> you can do that. If there's a plus five and a plus two there, or plus one, put the plus one or the plus two there. At least screw them on that. So I dig that aspect of it quite a bit. I would say that this is a really solid game. There's not a lot, aside from the rule book, there's not any huge problems with it. And every game that I played has been tight as well. And I like that. Some people don't. I know that some people would prefer, you know, to maybe sometimes that's a sign of there not being a ton of strategy to the game if the game can be really tight. But for me, I played with pretty game really gamers, people that knew what they were doing. That And if the game is really quick to pick up. So you can figure out your strategy and what you want to do early on. And all the games were still tight. And I think that's a really good sign. So Seven Kingdoms, if you can find it, I don't think it's too hard to find. I would seriously recommend it. Good, light, filler game. Not too long, not too quick. Enough time to get strategy in and some really interesting and unique mechanics. I highly recommend it.
Thanks for watching. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Patreon. And make sure to check out our sponsor, Board Game Bliss, where you can find an amazing selection of games from around the world. BoardGameBliss.com. Thanks for your support.